All right, thanks again for joining us. Um, again, my name is Leah and I'm the STEM programs coordinator with the National World War II Museum. Today, we're gonna to be exploring the features of an ecosystem um, at the beautiful Woodlands Conservancy with our Pontchartrain Conservancy educators, Kimberly and Gina. So there are additional materials that go along with this program. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a link to access those materials in the chat. Um, you can scroll down to the page where it says Scout Week Kickoff. And under this section, you'll find the accompanying materials. So these supplemental materials will provide scouts with information on how to extend the learning with hands-on activities at home. Um, this program will also be recorded and shared later if you wanna go back and use those additional materials at another time. So World War II was fought all across the globe from the tropical swamps of the South Pacific to the frigid mountains in Europe to the hot dry deserts of Northern Africa. So our soldiers and other personnel had to deal with a huge range of conditions as they experienced these different ecosystems. So this meant that the soldiers weren't just fighting the war, they were also dealing with the extreme natural conditions of the areas in which they served. This impacted the types of clothing and gear they had to use, as well as the challenges they faced, like having to deal with too much water or too little water, exposure to extreme cold or heat, and things like diseases from mosquitoes. Today, we're gonna to be talking about what makes up an ecosystem, and we're gonna be looking at the different characteristics of the ecosystems we have here in New Orleans. If you're attending in person at the museum and you wanna interact with our presenters or ask a question, head on over to our educator, Colin Makemson. He's gonna be located on the first floor of the US Freedom Pavilion. So that's gonna be the building with all the planes. So if you head on over to him, you can um, ask our presenters any questions or respond to any questions that the presenters will be asking us. So without further ado, I will turn this over to our friends at the Pontchartrain Conservancy. Hi everybody, I'm Kimberly Cook. I'm the education coordinator at the Pontchartrain Conservancy and behind the camera is Gina Cassie. She is our AmeriCorps education assistant. And as Leah told you, we are at the Woodlands Conservancy. Here's a map, feel free to um, Google it. And it's a, an amazing space that you should definitely come out and check out. And today we are working on a program called Ecosystems of the Basin. And as Leah said, there are accompanying materials that you can um, look through. But even if you don't have those with you right now, you can uh, follow along with us. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is what is an ecosystem? And so I want you to start thinking about what is a home because ecosystems are very much like a home. So in homes and in ecosystems, we have living things, which we would call biotic, and we have non-living things, which we would call abiotic. And so right now I'm gonna ask everybody to take a minute. You can look around your home if you want, or just think about it. What do you have in your home that is alive, that is living? And go ahead and share some answers with us. So again, these are biotic things that might be found in your home. What ideas do we have? So you guys can feel free to use the Q&A button to answer any, or to put in any answers to Kimberly's question. Um, even an I don't know is okay. That is totally okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would start by saying, and, and feel free to enter your answers, but first of all, I'm alive, you're alive, and you're in your home. So definitely you count as a biotic factor in your home, something that is living. Anybody else have maybe pets that are alive? So a dog or a cat, these are all living things in your home. Also plants, if you have any plants in your home. So now I want you to think about anything that may be abiotic or non-living in your home. So look around your home or think about it and what's in your home that actually isn't alive. Again, you can share the answers. If not, I'll suggest some. And you could just be thinking as well, but if you wanna share them, that's fine too. Any ideas? I know one that you may be watching now and that is your computer. So that is a non-living thing. And that is something that might be in your house. You might have a smartphone, a TV, a chair, the stove, all of those things are non-living things. So in our homes, um, some things are alive and some things are not, but they may not be the same for every home. And that's very much like an ecosystem. 
every ecosystem has living things and non-living things, but they're not always the same things. The final question I'm gonna ask you to think about is what is the color of the outside of your house? So again, share if you want to, if not, that's okay. But what does the outside of your house look like? What color is it? I know my house is white on the outside. Gina, what color is your house on the outside? My house is also white. Oh, we have some non-living things, some abiotic factors in homes, including a rat collection and a coin collection. Excellent. Good examples. Very good. And then your house might be red or it might be blue. But the point is that our houses are sometimes the same, like Gina and I have the same color on the outside of our house, but maybe I have plants and Gina doesn't. So our houses are uh, the same in some ways and different in others. And ecosystems are the same way. Again, they all have biotic or living things and abiotic, non-living things, but it's not always the same things. So let's use this as an example. So here's a really big map. If you're watching us from New Orleans or a surrounding area, this is Lake Pontchartrain here. And then we have the coast down here and the Birdfoot Delta, um, but, we have another area up here called the uplands. This is the North Shore. So I'm gonna ask you, what do you think all of this green represents? These are all ecosystems, but what is this green stuff probably? Somebody type in or share. And if you don't wanna type it in, you can just think about it. What could all that green on our map? And this is a satellite image. So it's a, a real image of this area. Any ideas? So someone suggested it could be rivers. Interesting. Okay. Anybody else? What's all this green stuff? So it's probably land, correct? But it's not all the same land. We'll talk about that in a minute. What does all the blue represent? I think we might have been on the right track with rivers if we're talking about mm -hmm. the blue area. Good point. So we're thinking if this is like Pontchartrain, we can so see that all Someone's guessing that the blue is going to mean the water. Someone else said swamp. Fantastic. These are great answers. So we've got water all around and we've got land. But my next question for you is if we were little people and we could get dropped down onto that map here, for instance, Mm -hmm. or down here, would it look the same or would it be like our houses? Some things would be the same and some things would be different. What do you all think? Is this green the same as this green or could there be some differences? See, someone said that the darker green might be dry land. Nice, uplands is a little drier. So up here we have a lot of pine trees, but what's down here in this green? Uh, someone, someone suggested said maybe forest. forest. Okay, but a different kind of forest, maybe like a cypress swamp, perhaps, right? So the green is not the same. It's very much like our house. There will be some things that are the same and some things that are different. And is the water the same way? Is this water the same as this water down here? Or could there be differences? Well, I know lake water is usually a little different from water further out in the Gulf. Well, this is definitely salt water. So this is the Gulf of Mexico. So we're going to find very different living things here than we would, for instance, in Lake Morapa, which is going to be freshwater. And so it's going to have different things living there. So it's like our homes. I'm going to put the map down now, but it's like our homes in the sense that some things are the same and some things are different. We are going to walk through a particular ecosystem now. I just mentioned a couple of cypress swamp, uplands, um, a saltwater marsh, but we are in an ecosystem called the bottomland hardwood forest. And the bottomland hardwood forest is what it sounds like. Bottomland meaning low land and hardwood trees, which we'll look at in a minute. But we're going to look at the flora, which are the plants, the fauna, which are the animals, and the hydrology, which is the water. If you want to follow along, the materials that Leah told you about talk about making a visual model of your ecosystem. In this case, the bottomland hardwood forest. Here is one we made, it's of a freshwater marsh and you can make it this way or you can make it whatever way works for you. But you can see that we put flora and fauna, in this case, a nutria, 
and iris. Um, and we put the hydrology, which is the water and the way that it moves. So you can do this with crayons, colored pencils, or you can just start drawing them and later create this um, when you're finished with this, this program. So follow along, add anything that you're interested in putting in your visual model and um, just do whatever you can do with us at this point. Again, this is in those accompanying materials. So let's start with the flora. So again, flora are plants and I'm standing next to a tree that is very common in bottomland hardwood forest. And that is a water oak. And if Gina comes in close, I'm gonna show you how I know this is a water oak. So it has these little leaves that look a little like a cat's paw. That's how I, or a mitten, whichever way you wanna remember it. But this is a water oak and there are many, many different kinds of oaks, but water oaks don't mind uh, really moist soil. In fact, they thrive in this kind of environment. And so this is a very common tree that you would find. And you can go ahead and draw that for your uh, visual model if you want. But we wanna pan to another water oak that unfortunately something has happened to. So let's take a look here. And you can see that, first of all, the water oak has really shallow roots. And you can see that the soil is really moist. In fact, if I grabbed some of that and pushed it into a big ball, it would stick together. And that shows us the bottom line hardwood forest, the hydrology is that the soil is moist almost all the time. And so sometimes it's flooded and sometimes it's not, uh, but there's always moist soil. So Gina's gonna pan a little bit and we're gonna ask you, what do you think happened to this tree? This is a water oak, but it has been damaged. So what might've happened here? You can type that in. Give us your ideas. What happened? This is a huge, very mature tree. So why is it laying on its side with uprooted like that? Any ideas? Yeah, what's well, strong enough to knock down a tree? Someone said a hurricane. Ah, what a great answer. In fact, if you live in this area, you'll know that we had a very active hurricane season and hurricanes are a threat to bottom line hardwood forests and other forests, as well as marshes. And in this case, Hurricane Zeta, uh, knock this tree down. And so we're gonna see several trees that were knocked down by that hurricane. But you can see one of the things with the, to think about why it did knock over is it has very shallow roots and the soil is very moist. So it did in fact knock over. But water oak is one of the plants you can put in your visual model if you want to. So let's walk on. When things fall down like this in a bottomland hardwood forest or any ecosystem, they begin to do something called decompose. And so that's a science word decompose. And there are certain organisms that help with that. Let's go find one. So you may see that there are some other plants that have been knocked down, likely by that hurricane or another storm. So here, Gina's gonna come in close. Does anybody know what these are? Any guesses? Good. So these right here. Someone so someone suggested that. maybe fungi? Yes, and they're really beautiful. And there are many, many, in fact, it's a very diverse kingdom, uh, the fungi. And so there are so many different kinds. But when you see fungus, they are working. They are decomposing whatever they're on. And so if you wanna back out just a little bit, this particular tree that they're on, is an elderberry tree. And so this tree, you can see it still has new growth. It's gonna get beautiful little white flowers and then they become dark sort of purplish um, berries and they are used by people, but also wildlife loves them. And in this case, I can see that this part of the tree has some damage. Now that could have been caused by the hurricane, for instance, that we saw that knocked down the water oak. It could also be from pest. So some kind of insect that has damaged the inside of the tree or even disease. So all of those things can lead to a weakness in the tree and then the fungus will start to decompose those areas. So this is one way that matter gets recycled in an ecosystem and that's really important because it's not gonna go to waste. It's gonna become something new and help with growth in the, in the forest. Let's move on. And I wanna show you another tree that unfortunately was uh, damaged by Hurricane Zeta, and I can identify this tree because of the remnants of the flowers. 
So it's really beautiful little tree. It's known as a swamp maple or red maple. And obviously from the color of the flowers. Unfortunately, this tree was damaged, but it's another tree like the water oak that really loves the moist soil. So we find it in the bottomland hardwood forest. This was a pretty mature tree. You can see where it cracked off of the main part of the tree. And there's something really interesting we wanna show you on this red maple, which is a totally different community of organisms that you would find in bottomland hardwood forest. So let's come in close. Let's look over this here. Here you might be able to get a good look. I put this piece here so you can get a good look, but there's several different kinds. Anybody know what this light green stuff is? Give us some guesses. Any guesses? Let's see, we can show them a different kind over here. Gina, if you wanna come, there's a whole, if, if Gina someone, Pan's really someone guessed lichen? Very good, someone knew, yes. Lichen, she's gonna pan, this tree is covered in lichen. And I'm gonna say that lichen is not like the mushrooms, it's not necessarily decomposing the tree. It's just, it's just living on it and not really harmful to the tree. Um, and there's more than one kind of lichen, but just so you know, it's not one organism. Can anybody guess what organisms make up lichen? If you had to guess, what's in there? Who's living together? It's green, so that gives us a little bit of a clue. Any ideas? All right, I'm gonna start you off. There's one that's tough and that's cyanobacteria. So there might be cyanobacteria working with fungi. Again, fungus and algae. So it could be a combination of things. And there are many different kinds of lichen. But just so you know, it's not when you're looking at it, it's not one organism. In fact, it's two to three organisms living together in a community, which is pretty cool. So again, very complex. But these are all biotic factors that we've been focusing on so far, correct? All right, let's talk about some of the, we talked about flora. We said red maple and the water oak, and we saw an elderberry. So those are three different plants you can put in your visual model. But let's talk about some of the fauna. So I wanna show you some, some damage, we'll call it. And let's see if you know who made this. So take a look right here. We've got some here. We've got a little bit over here. And then there's a good one over here, Gina, if you wanna show that. So who did this? And now we're not talking about plants, we're talking about the fauna, and that would be the animals. So what animal might live in the bottom line hardwood forest and be digging on the ground? Any ideas? No ideas? I'm gonna show you a picture. You guys tell me who this is. Sometimes we see them out here, but today they're not very active. Who is that? Can anyone name that animal? Have you seen one of these before? Someone said a muskrat. That's a really good guess. Someone said an this armadillo. This is also a mammal. It, yeah, it's a, it is an armadillo. And we see tons of armadillos out here digging for grubs and other things that might be in the soil. Now the soil is an abiotic factor and you can again, see how really moist it is. But in it, you get little um, insects with their larva and whatnot, might lay an egg and then they're developing underground and the armadillos will come along and, and eat them up. So that's what's happening here. Now there's another critter that might have done this if the damage was more intense. Here it's not so big, but there's a really large animal that comes through and we would call it a non-native invasive species. And that is the feral hog. Now they come around and they root around and the damage is much more intense and encourages erosion. So invasive species are a threat to our ecosystems and they are unfortunately really abundant in the bottom line hardwood forest here. So that is again, a feral hog. The armadillo on the other hand has been naturalized over a long, long time. So they, they are here normally. So other things you might find, let's take a look. Who is this? I'm sure you all know who that is. Now they would be up higher 
um, and they would be hunting, but that is a bald eagle. So feel free to add a bald eagle to your ecosystem uh, visual model if you want for the bottom line hardwood forest. And then also we might find, I know you all know who that is. These critters, the raccoons are very versatile. We find them in most of our ecosystems around here um, because they are so versatile. So you can include a raccoon in your picture if you want to. Who is this? A white-tailed deer. So we would also see white-tailed deer out here, which is really cool. And then this little buddy is a migratory bird. We are on the Mississippi Flyway and we get a lot of birds that migrate and stop over here. And this is the prothonotory warbler. So we get a lot of songbirds and other pretty birds. We do have resident birds that are here year round like the American crow, the blue jay, the cardinal. So those birds you're gonna see all the time. But this bird you would see seasonally when it stops over. All right, we're gonna move on and we're gonna quiz you on a couple of things. Let's take a little walk. So you can see that, I don't know if Gina can show, it's very muddy. And that's because as I said, there's always moisture in a bottomland hardwood forest um, because it is low lying. So we're gonna show you something and I want you to tell me what it means for this plant. So if we look right here, I see a different kind of fungi. So what does that mean for this tree? Somebody tell me what it means that we're seeing fungi. I told you a little while ago when we were talking about the elderberry that when we see fungus, it's doing something. And what could that mean for this tree? So we've got a couple of suggestions. One is that it means the tree is dying. The other is that it means the tree is decomposing. Excellent. It, it may be dying. This one may actually be dying. We see a couple of places where it's broken off. But at the very least, it means it might have disease or insect pest, right? And those are doing the job of decomposing those damaged areas. So very good. But remember on the elderberry, we saw areas that were still healthy. So it just depends on how damaged the tree is. So very good. All right, let's press on. And you can see over here a similar situation going on more decomposition and who made this haul down here more evidence Let's see would anyone like to guess what made on hole? who made that hole someone guessed armadillo very good exactly you guys are paying attention i like it all right, we're gonna have you ID one of the trees you would find in a bottomland hardwood forest. Think about what I've told you about the couple of trees we have seen. And let's take a close look at this tree. So what tree, and this is a very young tree. Oh, it came off. What is this? Think back to the trees that I've showed you. I showed you a water oak, a red maple, and an elderberry. Which one might this be? Any thoughts? So we had some clues. The first one I told you looked like a little cat's paw or a mitten was the water oak. So this is a young water oak. The red maple had the red flowers at this time of year anyway. And then the elderberry we saw, um, well, it doesn't have its white flowers right now, but that's a way to tell. So this is a very young water oak. Again, another common species you would find in bottomland hardwood forest. But if I look down here, this is another little baby tree. And Jeannie, you want to come in close and show them? This is a very young red maple. So the tree that we saw covered in lichen, this is what it was. And this one is brand new and growing. While I'm down here, there's another really cool plant I like. And this is what makes up the understory of the bottom line hardwood forest. A lot of these weedy plants that have different, different, um, different things that they do. This one in particular has a really neat thing that it does. It sticks to you. So kids played with this a lot when they were young and it's called cleaver, it's a cleaver plant, but it grows everywhere. And that is just a really good technique for it to get its seeds traveling in different places. 
So all the different uh, living things in these ecosystems have ways that they survive and whatnot. So let's press on. And we want to show you another really dominant tree in a bottomland hardwood forest. So we saw a water oak, but there are many kinds of oaks. This oak in front of me is a live oak. And so if you've been to City Park or anywhere around New Orleans, you've seen them with their big branches coming down. And it looks very different than the water oak, right? So the shapes of the leaves are very different. Um, and it has different roots than the water oak. This one's right up on the water and it doesn't mind the moist soil either. And so we can see that it's fine in a bottom line hardwood forest. However, this canal behind it is human made. So this is not the natural part of the hydrology here in a bottom line hardwood forest. This is something that people have put here. And Gina's gonna pan up to something that we see that shows us that we're actually right up next to another ecosystem called the urban ecosystem. And so that leads us to our next thing that we wanted to tell you about, and that's ecotones. So ecotones are when two ecosystems bump up next to each other. In this case, the bottom line hardwood forest that we've been looking at and the urban ecosystem, which is made by humans, right? So we're gonna go look at whether there's an ecotone formed here. And we know that because in ecotones, they share some of the living and non-living things of both ecosystems. So let's go do a little Venn diagram. And you can do one on a piece of paper with yourself, or you can just follow along with us on ours. You're gonna come up in this little pavilion. And it's a major shift to the urban, you can see. So go ahead and start looking around because you're gonna give me ideas about what's in an urban ecosystem. have a nice little Venn diagram here. And again, if you want to make one, you can. You're just going to draw two circles overlapping. And one's going to represent the bottom line hardwood forest, which looks a little like this. Now, this one is up against a canal, much like ours was. And your second circle will represent an urban ecosystem. So a city, basically, or a town. So again, if you want to follow along, go ahead and draw those. All right. Now, in this particular bottom line hardwood forest, because it is right up next to an urban ecosystem, this is a great tie-in to the World War II Museum. So you can see that back in this bottom line hardwood forest that we hiked out further, there are bunkers. And these bunkers were built in World War II in the bottom line hardwood forest because the forest covered them from aerial view. So you really couldn't see them, which meant it was a safe place, but that's all our hardwoods, our live oaks, our water oaks, um, and red maple and all the other trees that we saw out there would be creating a canopy that would protect these. So find out more about that on the Woodlands Conservancy website. Um, and you can find out more about that. And if you come out here, you can actually visit them. But for now, I want you to come up with some ideas about living and non-living things that we would find in the different ecosystems. So I'll start us off. In the bottomland hardwood forest, we saw a red maple. Now, are there red maples in the urban? Do we have red maples in cities? What do you all think? Any ideas? Hmm. Well, that little baby red maple was right close to where we were at the canal. So I'm gonna put it in both. In fact, we do sometimes get red maples in urban ecosystems as well. Yep, we've got someone agreeing with you on that mm -hmm. one. All right, what else? What might only be in the bottomland hardwood forest? Think about some of our animals. Do you see, for instance, bald eagles in your neighborhood? What do you guys think? Someone says, no, they don't see bald eagles in their neighborhood. So how about I put bald eagles only in our bottom land hardwood forests? All right. What's something we only see in the urban environment that we didn't see out here at all? 
ideas. You saw it when Gina panned, I think. What did Gina and I get out here in? How did we get out to this forest? Anybody? Did we drive a... Someone says a car. car. Yeah, car. So car is, you're not really gonna see that in a true bottomland hardwood forest. What else? Think of some other things we've talked about. How about raccoon? Where should I put raccoon? Only urban in the middle for both? or only bottom line hardwood forest? Where do you want me to put raccoon? We've got a suggestion to put it in the middle. You're absolutely right. I know you've seen raccoons in your neighborhood somewhere or parks, and we, ha we told you they live out here. So we would have to put that in the ecotone, that area where the two meet. So I'm gonna put raccoon here. All right, what else? How about our feral hog? Where should I put it? Does it belong in urban, in bottom line hardwood forest, or both? Hmm. We've got a suggestion that it goes in both. This is a good point. I will say that they, they are not really running around the cities, <laughs> but they are, they are right at the edge of uh cities so i think we could what do you guys think here put it here let's see someone suggested it just goes in the forest interesting all right i'm gonna say that we're not picturing it running on the street so let's say here but it does get real close to here so we'll put mm -hmm. feral hog i think they're a good sign that there are people close by yeah we'll put it we'll put it kind of close to our ecotone but there you're right go. they don't really Maybe there's a little bit of overlap here. We'll put that. All right. What's something we only find in the urban ecosystem? Give me some other ideas over here. What do you live in? What have we been talking about from the very beginning? Buildings. Buildings. Very good. Now, we know that the, the bunkers are here, but that's unusual. That's not a normal thing. And so we won't put them. They're not normally in a bottom line hardwood forest. So you're right, we're gonna put buildings over here. All right, give me some other ideas. Y'all just type them in and I'll start writing them. Any other ideas? How about one of our birds? Let's do, uh, not the bald eagle, let's do um, a blue jay. Where would I put a blue jay? If you know what a blue jay is or a cardinal, you might know a cardinal better, but how about a blue jay? It's that blue bird that's kind of loud. Do you ever see them in your town? Mm. Well, I've definitely seen them in my backyard. So. I have one in a tree out my window. So, and they are definitely out here. We did tell you that they live out here too. So we could add blue jay here. But what about that warbler that I told you about that comes, it was the prothonotory warbler. I told you it comes at different times of the year. Would it come to your town or would it come to the forest? Any thoughts? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a hint. It likes to be deep within nature. <laughs> it doesn't wanna be here. And so we're gonna put warbler here. It's only gonna be in the bottomland hardwood forest or cypress swamp as well, but definitely not urban. Anything else we should add? How about, Gina, can you pan over there? What's across the bayou over there? or it's actually not a bayou, sorry, the canal. What is that silver thing? You all see that? I don't know, it's hard to make out. Can you see it from there? Maybe not, it's kind of gray today. How about fences? Where should I put fences? Uh, yes, you've got a suggestion to include a fence. Where would a fence go? Where do you want that fence? And yep, they would belong in an urban, urban environment. right? Good. So you begin to see, so over here we've listed, um, these are all abiotic things, car, fences, buildings that are human made. Over here, we don't have any human made things. We have, at this point, we've just listed uh, fauna, but we could add 
for instance, is the water oak. Where would I put the water oak, y'all? Would it need to be in the ecotone? So where they meet? Is it primarily in the bottomland hardwood forest or is it in urban environments too? What do you all think for the water oak, like the large one that we saw on the ground? We have some different opinions. We have some who say urban, some who say forest. This is a good question. I will say that water oak, remember it has really shallow roots. So it's not a very popular tree to plant in urban areas because like we saw, um, it falls over and it needs really moist soil and our houses don't need moist soil. So water oh, oaks are more likely just in the bottomland hardwood forest. And so I'll put it over here. Now the live oak, where should we put our live oak that we saw? Now that's a different story, remember. So where do you want me to put it? Only in, we know it's in bottomland hardwood forest, but was it in, in the urban as well? Some people are saying both. Yes, absolutely. And if you live in New Orleans, you know that. So I should put it in our ecotone. Live oak was on the very border. Um, and you can even see it from where we are, Gina, if you want to show them, but we'll put that in the ecotone. And I've got a question for y'all. Where should I put fungi? All that fungi we saw, is it only in the bottom on hardwood forest? Do you find it in both? Or would it be only in urban? What do you all think? Where should I put the fungi? All right, someone's saying we should put them in both. That's correct. We're gonna find it wherever there's decomposition. I'm gonna put fungus, but okay. Is there anything else you all wanna add? Or are you starting to get the idea that an ecotone is gonna have things from both ecosystems that in fact are more versatile, like the raccoon is really versatile. The blue jay, the live oak's pretty tolerant. Fungus is gonna go anywhere there's decom decomposition. But these need special things, the bald eagles, the warbler, the water oak, they need special soils, they need space, um, they need a place to nest. And so they can't necessarily be here. And these that we've seen are, we happen to list abi abiotic things that people made. So it's very interesting. And you could continue to do this this activity for yourself. And just remember that this in fact is the ecotone. So this area in between that shares characteristics from both of the ecosystems. And in this case, bottomland hardwood forest and urban. We wanted to talk about threats because ecotones lead us to the idea that there are things that pressure these natural ecosystems like a bottomland hardwood forest. In this case, these things can be um, stressors on these other spaces, these ecosystems. So we have a little activity set up over here and we want to play it with you. And these have pictures of animals and plants of flora and fauna from a bottomland hardwood forest. So what we're going to do is imagine that right now this is a really healthy ecosystem, all right? And all the little things are working together and let's see some of the critters. You can see an American alligator. We have a white-tailed deer, a luna moth, uh, a great egret, a skink. Here's our bald eagle. There's our raccoon, a coyote. So a lot of different things. First of all, you can add all of those to your visual model if you want as well. And again, all of that's in the accompanying materials. But for now, let's imagine that there are some threats to this. So what I'm going to do is roll this die. And for every color I take out, we'll see what happens to our ecosystem. And we'll imagine some things that might be threatening those particular species. So first I'm gonna remove a yellow and yellow are our reptiles. So in this case, I'm gonna remove, let's see, I'm gonna remove this green anole. So right here, whoo, I gotta be careful already. <laughs> okay. So I'll hold that up close. This is a green anole. And so we may have lost the green anole because of, of an invasive species called the brown anole. The brown anole competes with the green anole. It is larger um, and is very uh, prolific, meaning it's very common and does well. So maybe we're imagining that the brown anole, which was an introduced invasive species, has taken over from the green anole. And unfortunately, we've lost them. So we'll take them out of our healthy ecosystem. And already we can see our ecosystem doesn't look so great. Let's roll. All right, 
there are no blues in this one. They represent fish. And because bottomland hardwood forest doesn't necessarily have standing water, we didn't include any fish. So I'll keep going. And we need a, a pink. Pink represents our mammals. So I'm gonna take out, let's see. Ah, let's take out this one. This is one that we didn't mention, but you can put it in your visual model. And that is the Louisiana black bear. Now, in this case, we can imagine that the Louisiana black bear disappeared from our bottom line hardwood forest because it was too close to an urban ecosystem. And so it really needs a lot of space. And because it's being uh, squeezed in between a bunch of urban ecosystems, there wasn't enough space for our black bear anymore. So we'll take our black bear out. Let's see, who's next? Purple represents our invertebrates. So I think I'm gonna take out, it's getting tricky y'all. <laughs> Let's take out our water scorpion. All right. So this particular species is a water scorpion. It's what we call an aquatic macroinvertebrate. And there is standing water sometimes in a bottomland hardwood forest after, like especially in the spring where there's a lot of rain, but maybe the water is polluted now from what we call non-point source pollution, meaning runoff from people's cars. And if we're butted up right against an urban ecosystem, like all those cars we saw in that parking lot, they can leak oil, et cetera, and that can get in surrounding water, which can introduce pollution into the water where these critters live. How is our ecosystem looking? Anybody weigh in? What do you think? Is it healthy? Is it having some problems? What do we think? Any thoughts? It's looking a little unstable to me. Such a great choice of a word. It's a little unstable. And as we lose species, whether they're invertebrates or mammals or plants, the there is a, a missing piece to the ecosystem. So just like in your home, you need those living and non-living things to make your home feel complete. An ecosystem also needs all of those things. So let's roll again and see what happens. All right, we're having to take out another invertebrate. I'm gonna take out the Luna moth. We're gonna give it a try, y'all ready? <laughs> oh, okay. So this is a Luna moth and again, maybe it was impacted by the fact that there were uh, there was development in the bottom line hardwood forest and some of the trees and other plants that it depends on were cut down uh, or possibly after the hurricane. You know, you gotta think we lost all those trees and that is habitat for all these different species. So the Luna moth disappeared from our particular bottom line hardwood forest. And as a result, look at our ecosystem. It's looking pretty vulnerable. I'm gonna use the word vulnerable and certainly impacted. All right, let's roll again. This time I'm taking out a yellow. Okay, this is getting challenging, my friends. Let's take out, <laughs> how about we take out uh, this one right here? Okay, this is our American alligator. Uh-oh, y'all, can I do it? Woo it's harder and harder, all right. That's the American alligator. And maybe the bottom line hardwood forest, as we said, was uh, being threatened by development because of it being right up next to an urban ecosystem. And so there just wasn't enough space for the alligator. And this can be really a problem for our alligators. They become designated nuisance um, animals and that's not their fault. It's really our fault because we're encroaching on their ecosystem. And in this case, the bottom line hardwood forest. So should we go again? What do we I think, think so. yes? Yeah, let's start making some predictions about what you guys think might happen if enough animals go away. And plants. And plants. I'm gonna take a mammal while you think about those predictions. Pink represents mammals. I think I'm gonna go for the white-tailed deer who also needs a lot of space. <laughs> oh, we've got one prediction. Someone thinks it's gonna collapse. <laughs> Was that your prediction? I wonder. It sure was. <laughs> awesome. Good prediction. Yes, I tried to take out that white-tailed deer because again, it needs space and trees and with the trees damaged or with um, development encroaching, the deer would not have had enough space. So you can see there were all these different threats to our bottom land hardwood forest. And as we lost species, it became very unstable and vulnerable. 
and it will collapse. And that is literally what happens. We need the biotic and abiotic factors that make it a complete ecosystem, just like you do. So if we wanted to rebuild it, we'd have to bring back those species. And this is why a lot of people do what we call restoration or other conservation activities to try to bring different species back. In fact, for instance, our bald eagle was on the endangered species list. So was the American alligator for a long while. And both of those species were protected. And as they were protected, the ecosystem that they lived in also gained protection. And as that happened, we were able to rebuild that ecosystem back into a healthy ecosystem. But again, you need all of those species, plants and animals, flora and fauna, to have a complete and healthy ecosystem. At this point, as I build that last little layer, we're going to ask you all if you have any questions about bottom line harvest forests, ecosystems in general, or anything else we talked about today. Anybody have any questions? You can ask me about ecotones, you name it. And there's our healthy ecosystem again. So Leah, at this point, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer them. All right, so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I'm curious, what are your guys' favorite flora or fauna in the bottom line hardwood forest? Oh, that's a hard question, but I was just putting one of them back. And Leah, I know you're familiar with it, and that's American Beautyberry. It's, um, I think I have a picture. Let me show everybody. It's a beautiful plant, and the berries are great for different species. Um, and it was used traditionally for a lot of different things by indigenous folks. So that's American Beauty Bear, but it's definitely one of my favorites. Gina, do you have a favorite? Um, I am definitely a fan of Luna moths. Mm -hmm. I think that moths get a reputation for being kind of ugly compared to butterflies, <laughs> but a lot of moths are very beautiful just in maybe a different way than we perceive beauty. So I'm very partial to Luna moths. I think they're very cool, very important as well for the ecosystem. I'm going to mention copperheads too. We don't have a picture of a copperhead, but a copperhead is a venomous snake that you would find in a bottom land hardwood forest. And I just want to emphasize that snakes are such an important part of the ecosystems that they live in. They um, control populations of, for instance, rodents and other things. And they're just incredibly important. And unfortunately, sometimes get a bad rap, but they're just um, amazing uh, creatures. It's a copperhead, it's a beautiful snake. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, what about, do you guys know if there's any edible plants out there? That's another really good question. So elderberry, um, the tree that we showed you that had a fungus on it, the very first one, it gets the white flowers and they have traditionally been used to make a tea, which is really good. And then the berries themselves have a lot of uh, medicinal properties and have been used um, to help uh, create syrup or other things that help when you're not feeling so well. So. Yeah, elderberries one. Do you have any that you're thinking of? One that comes to mind, I think it's more commonly found in the uplands, so on the North Shore, but I know that chanterelle mushrooms, so that's a type of fungus that is edible and actually very much sought after. A lot of people will go hunting for them. Chanterelles, though, they don't grow on decomposing material. So they're a little bit different from some of the fungus that we saw today. I see, and oyster mushrooms, I've seen them out in bottom line hardwood forest, and they're another one that's edible, uh, really yummy, <laughs> and um, and they are they are decomposing actually. They do uh, that job, so it just varies. Pickerel, which is is another plant that you might find, has been used traditionally um, as food for different things. So it just depends. All right, and then one last question. Someone was curious about the barracks out in the woodlands. Is there a relationship between the type of ecosystem that you guys are in and maybe the choice of that location for the barracks? That's such a great question. And, you know, we'd have to look back to why they decided, but I will say there's a large naval base here um, in Bell Chase, which is where we are. Um, however, with uh, we didn't want them to be visible to, to radar well in the world we're doing some different things, but we wanted to make sure that um, they weren't visible. So, they build out there where they build 
um, is interesting too. It would be an interesting research project to figure out, but probably they picked it because it is wooded and it has a, a pretty healthy canopy, especially back then it would have had a really healthy canopy to cover of the barracks so they weren't visible. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both so much um, for that really great presentation. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have for today. Um, in the chat, we're going to be posting some links. Um, I just want to let them know, Leah, that they can email their visual models if they create them. We'd love to see them to education at scienceforourpost.org. And if they're interested in finding out about the flora, fauna, and hydrology of other ecosystems in this area, those are all in those accompanying materials. So they could focus on freshwater marsh or saltwater marsh or cypress swamp, um, urban if they wanted to. And so all of those are available to them to find out more. All right, awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of really good stuff on their website. If you guys wanna go check that out, that would be awesome. Um, we're also posting um, a link to their YouTube channel as well. Um, so I encourage you guys to go check out their website. Um, it's going to be linked here in the chat, but then it's also found from our activity guide if you want if you guys want to keep exploring. Um, so I'm also putting up links to the World War II Museum Scout Week activity guide, as well as the Scout Week webpage, um, where you can check out all the other exciting activities that we have planned for you guys this week. Um, so if you haven't pre-registered to attend Scout Week at the museum, there's still time. So Scout Week is going to be ongoing through January 31st. So check out our website for additional details and to download the activity guide. So from all of us at the National World War II Museum, thank you to Kimberly and Gina um, from the Pontchartrain Conservancy for this amazing program and kicking off Scout Week um, on such a great note. And thank you to our scouts in the audience for joining us today. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks, Leah. Bye, all. Bye.